women literally take their pictures out of sets of photographs and won't let them go into the family album because they don't like the way they look. That's all they don't like about it. They have become an image and they would rather destroy the image and therefore become absent from the event than put in an image that actually isn't quite what they want it to be. I think you always have to go back in order to move on. I carried a photograph around with me in my bag for a long time and I showed it to people. And they were quite shocked, I think. It's quite normal to show a picture of your live baby, but I think a lot of people were quite shocked to see a photograph of your dead baby. I don't think there's any particular point in your life that, that is unacceptable to be photographed. Um, and again, it, it, that thing comes in where, by photographing it, it means you are an acceptable person in whatever state you're in. Being British, we were very puritanical um, about nakedness and about sexuality and about our bodies. The family album manages to, st to straightjacket us because we have a limited sense of ourselves, because we have um, a very sparse imagery of ourselves. And if we start to open up the range of images we have of ourselves in the family album, then we start to redefine our sense of self, sense of family. It's very different to take a, ba um, a photograph of a dead baby um, rather than a live baby. It's quite shocking to a lot of people. Jeanette Briley, who, who works at St Mary's Hospital, when she first came there, would go to the mortuary and take babies out, dress them and take photographs of them. As she said, a lot of people were very shocked when she did this. But they soon came to realise that that's, the parents were eternally grateful to her for doing that. You never get over it as such. It's always with you. But somehow you come to terms with it and you use your photographs to come to terms with it. Many women were told when the baby would die, forget about it, go home, have another baby. That's the end of it. And were never allowed to talk about it, even within their own family. And. I think for that reason, could, could never ever come to terms with the fact that they, that baby had died. About a week out after she died, I remember thinking, I really must see her face again. And that's when I started looking at the photographs. Um, and I suppose I looked at them, you know, every day, that's the, my eldest daughter, Mavanui, who was four at the time. And she, she was so... She didn't cry, but she was obviously very, very sad. I had been waiting for this baby for a long time, been very excited about it. And she just wanted to hold her all the time and cuddle her. So that photograph is very, means a lot to me. If someone came to the house, I would show them the photographs. It was a way of talking about her. It was a way of breaking down the barrier. Because death is a, a rather a taboo in our society, and, and we don't like to talk about dead people. But a photograph helps you to, to break those barriers. I think I think of my my philosophical fight against passage of time. Uh, if you photograph something, you are what I call you are freezing time. I have this anguish of uh, feeling that time is escaping from my hands. Right, I'm going from from birth to 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 death, and uh, I, I can't accept that. Well, death is something that uh, well, we don't understand death, or I don't understand death, and uh, I don't accept it. 
So if something is, although it's out of my control, but I, I can't accept it. I, I have, I've realized that many of my photographs are related to, to control time, right? To keep something that pleases me or a person or a place or a period that uh, I liked. I want, I, want, I want to freeze that. But I think you always have to sort of go back to it in order to move on. Because you can't just forget, you can't just suppress something, otherwise it's going to come up in a different form. After we split up, I decided I didn't decide, I just had an emotional need to actually go back and look at pictures. Images that hadn't been important to me before all of a sudden became important because they started to tell me things I hadn't realised. In one of them, he actually has his back turned to me, which I think is what he was most probably doing the whole year. And secondly, the picture's quite interesting because there's a couple in the background with um, a baby. They, that seems very significant, the fact that when Chris left, he went off to live with somebody who already had, an, already had a child. If I hadn't had those photographs, it would have, like, been as though the past hadn't existed, really, as though it had been totally eradicated or sort of airbrushed out. The photographs were actually proof that our relationship had existed, that certain things had happened, that we had been on holiday together, um, that we had kissed at certain times. They were like a touchstone, um, a contact with the past, a sort of memory. When you have something like the Holocaust that happens, you, it's very difficult to comprehend that people actually existed and then they didn't exist. And this shows me that they did, that there, there was something before my mother. And also, sometimes I do touch the photos a lot and think about the connection I have with them. And sometimes fleetingly, I find myself thinking that maybe the awful things that I think happened to them didn't. Well, like this one, which is of my grandmother and her elder sister and her father. And sometimes I just look at that and I guess also think about knowing what was in store for them because I think they had no idea at that particular time what was, what was going to happen for the Jews. And it was never talked about at home. We weren't allowed to ask questions. If anything came on the television, the telly was turned off. I don't think I had any understanding then of how deep the oppression had gone and how deep the self-hatred was. And this went on through my university years. That if people would have asked me what my identity was, I would have been hard pushed to say I was a woman, you know, let alone anything else. But as for Jew, I guess I just learnt because of the anti-Semitism that it wasn't safe to be Jewish. So I bleached my hair at the first possible opportunity and I learnt German as one of my major subjects at school and I learnt it very easily and I became very fluent in it. And people used to say to me when I used to go to Germany, they'd, they didn't know that I wasn't German. And I was very pleased about that. I felt that it's this whole notion, false notion, that you can pass There were a series of photographs that I, I disliked tremendously. <laughs> it was the photographs of the period when I was uh, doing the military service. Everything that I saw there was so unacceptable, so poor, spiritually poor, that I didn't want to, to, to remember that I was part of that. And the best way to do that was by destroying the photograph, because photographs are very strong. I tore them up. Yes, I just tore them up, because um, <laughs> it was my act of violence <laughs> against another violence, I think. I felt an enormous pleasure to destroy these photographs. 
because I was getting rid of something. My feeling was that I was, I was destroying a reality that was already inside me. And by doing that, I just took this reality out of me. And I had enormous pleasure, yes. I, I get annoyed with myself because I'm so influenced by what I'm supposed to look like that I'm being worried about what I look like in a photograph. I mean, who cares? But, but I still feel it. I mean, my mother will go to the length of cutting her photograph out. She would just cut herself out and keep that in a separate place. I ate photos of me, and if I'm on them, it's by accident. I'm not poems. I just ate them. I just never look right. Not how I think I feel. I seem to look different. <laughs> That's somebody else on a photo, not me. I think the image that you have of yourself very rarely comes out. In photographs of yourself, you're always slightly disappointed, or not so much disappointed, but dissatisfied. You know, everybody has the, the yearning to be immortalized perfectly. Um, speaking now as a woman, I, I would say that I've been taught that my femininity has to be ideal. So what I'm looking for when I look through images of myself is this as good as I can get my act together self. Because I know that there is no ideal self in that sense. I cannot get that act together. So what there is is a slippage between the, the narcissism that's created through the images thrown at me and my feeling of shame that I can never live up to them and my discontent with myself, not with the images, discontent with myself. And the older I get, the more that becomes irrelevant. And I mean, I've seen women pushing that down and down and down. And in the end, all it means is lipstick or earrings or something. But there has to be some kind of control that's linked to that earlier desire. It's only if one has an ideal self that you're going to be loved or valued in this culture. That's what seems to be happening with the kind of images and stories that come at us. Once upon a time, long, long ago, in the middle of a cold, cold winter, there was a queen. of women have this sort of ideal self which they can't actually live up to. The end result is that they actually end up censoring their family albums. Um, so they hide or discard or destroy images of themselves they don't actually like.
This is um, my piece of work called A Lover's Distance, which grew out of Chris and I, our relationship splitting up. As a way of speaking to Chris, I don't think I thought he'd ever listen to me. I think my suicide had been an attempt to say the sort of loudest scream that I made, and then when he didn't even listen to that, I thought, right, I'm going to do a piece of work about it, you're going to have to listen to that. <laughs> piece of work was actually trying to externalise what I felt internally, having the idea of someone being blind, not being able to see when you're in love, and trying to sort of visualise that, that concept, and almost a cliché as well. And this was an image of Chris as a victim. And it was also not just to do with me murdering him, literally, after having dreams about doing it. It was quite nice to sort of actually stage it. But apart from that, it was also trying to reverse the roles, so that rather than me trying to kill myself and internalising it and not becoming angry, just taking it in on myself, I was actually externalising it and trying to murder him. I don't feel as I want to kill him anymore. I don't feel that strongly about him, thank God. <laughs> I think this process of, of using yourself and yourself as an image um, is very important for women because we are confounded by so many images of women, idealised pictures of women, and to actually take control or try and take control to a certain extent, even on such a small scale of yourself. It's very important because it gives you um, control back and not being totally passive, you're actually being active. And it's a thing that women tend to do quite a lot, to, to look after other people more than they actually look after themselves. When I, when I was working on the photographs, um, people, people accused me of narcissism, and, um, and I didn't really see it as that. I saw it as a form of of self-love and of repairing the cuts and, and the damage that I thought had been done. Um, and there seems to be this, this blurring of boundaries between narcissism and, and looking at yourself. And I saw it as a very political act in the sense that to do anything that, that involves change, um, you have to start by changing yourself and then move out from that. It is self-indulgent narcissism, but it ought to be celebrated as, as such, rather than being condemned. that we live in a culture that invites us to be narcissistic, to continually be looking for an ideal self. What I'm talking about isn't a whimsical thing, by the way. It's actually much deeper than that. I mean, if one could think of all the times that we know, and we've done it ourselves, that particularly women literally take their pictures out of sets of photographs and won't let them go into the family album because they don't like the way they look. And phototherapy is a reversal of that. I think the further I got into this work, the more I began to realise that most of my life I've wanted to pass myself off as something that I wasn't, which the more I worked on notions of beauty, the more I realised was to do with class, because all the things I wanted to become in the images, when I looked at them and I got them back, were nothing to do with my own reality at all. They were all kind of myths that I'd grown up with. It was about that side of me that has been repressed for a very long time, which desires to be beautiful and wanting to be loved by millions. And in order to get there, uh, Rosie and I had to encourage each other to dress up and um, stop actually taking the mickey out a bit of trying to be beautiful and begin to take it seriously. So we, ha we had a lot of fun just playing about with clothes and props and makeup. Just felt fantastic to do it, 
And here I was at the end of this great performance, taking my, bla taking my bow with the flowers in my hand. And it was very difficult to keep a straight face, but I finally got into it. And I, I mean, it was just beautiful to be, able, to be able to play freely and do it and not have to keep all these voices in my head saying, don't do that, that's definitely not an okay thing to do. I borrowed from Rosie a beautiful black lacy dress. And that's my idea of glamour. It's my idea in as much as I can allow myself to even dream of being glamorous, because that's not how I actually see myself. When I had got them together, I realised that they're just complete... It's a complete stereotype of glamour. So the, the next set of pictures is really about the problem of how I would really like to have been glamorous as a young woman. I knew how to stand, I knew how to display myself for the camera, but in fact that isn't how I live my life. So what I did was to create this image, which is what I call my Rita Hayworth, as best as I can do it act, but of course it isn't good enough. But actually, I'm so traumatised by what that might bring me that I couldn't actually do it. So the second shot, which is this one, is much more about how I felt inside my head while I was trying to do that. And when I put the two together, I mean, I have an incredible movement across the two of feelings of longing and desire on the one hand and fear and uh, being found out on the other hand that I'm not going to deliver the goods because in my, when I was a young woman, you know, there's no way I was going to deliver anything. I just wanted to be admired for how I looked. But in fact, I, that isn't how I live my life. You know, that, you know, I was the girl next door. I was Doris Day, I'm afraid. Oh, I, I love that picture. I absolutely love it. It's my all-time favorite. That's working on um, my sexuality. And I was appalled at the only two images I could come up with was this one, which is what I call my Hollywood Virgin Bride scenario, which is the whole, you know, the full of promise, but nothing's going to happen afterwards. This one is uh, another matter than the other one. This is what I call working on grief, inner grief, and it's the grief of never having had a child, never delivered the goods, never been a good girl for my parents. And it's a, it's a grief that's put upon me from outside. Playing is a, you know, it's a phenomenal thing that happens when you play, that you play something out until you don't need it anymore. So going into phototherapy is a reversal back into play and saying, now, how can I reinvent myself out of this very limited range of possibilities? So narcissism can be very healthy because you create the images, you actually inhabit the images as limited as they are. And in the doing of it, in the playing about, the real pleasure for me is in destroying them. It's such a pleasure. In a sense, I like myself much more because I'm drawing through the work on, a, on my own history and saying, well, I'd rather belong to that history than this fictional history that is nothing to do with me. The, the, the strange thing about this kind of work is that, in a sense, in looking at things historically and going back, you're coming to terms with death and loss. But in the, the coming to terms with all this loss and grief, what you're doing is actually slowly coming to life. I've, it's quite extraordinary that, that, you know, because you're letting things go, just letting them go away. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.